is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Sky Sworn, the fourth book in the Cradle series, chapters one, two, and three. In these chapters, prison does not go how I thought it would go. I was so concerned at the end of the last book, it turns out I need not have worried my pretty head about it. Also, Jai Daisho is... It's not going to go well for him. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Andy for commissioning this episode. So I've been thinking a lot about what it is that makes this series so much fun to cover, because I will say right now, this is in my top five things that I've been commissioned to cover. So thank you, Andy, for bringing this into my life. And I'm realizing that part of what I think is so enjoyable is that this series lets us have wins. And that's not something that every series allows you to get. And, and I don't want to make that sound like, you know, anything that makes that, you know, any story that has a, difficult plot is not good or not fun. I would say that the Broken Earth series is in my top five series I've ever covered. And that is a really bleak series in a lot of ways. It's rough, but it's beautifully thought out. It's amazingly written and so moving. And yet, despite its bleakness the heaviness of its subject matter, it also lets us have some wins. And I think that's what I need in a series, at least at this point in my life. It has been rough lately, guys. I don't think I'm alone in that. Feeling like you just can't win, you know? I think a lot of us have been feeling like we've been running head on into a brick wall over and over again, hoping that brick wall will go somewhere or do something and it's just not happening. And we're starting to be like, why are we even doing this? And having this series that is a really, it's a big project, Lyndon being the project, uh, getting him up to par, him having to prepare to fight this like, creature or stop some like kind of apocalyptic scenario 30 years out. This is all a very big ask. But because of the fact that we have these like this very carefully tiered system of ascension, because we have really easy to define goals within the story, like this fight that's coming up with uh, Jai Long coming up so much sooner than I expected, by the way, because of all of this, it makes you feel like you're making progress towards this huge thing that's not happening for another 29 years. Like, it just makes you feel as if the story is progressing and that you are really getting to see some of the fruits of your protagonist's labor And your labor as a reader. Because it's really easy to have a story that's sort of winding and doesn't really feel focused enough to keep your eyes on the the end goal. Or it keeps you too much focused on the end goal. And you don't really enjoy the middle of the story because you can't stop thinking about getting to the end. And... You know, one of my favorite examples of this is the Twilight series in which so little happens 
that you tear through the books, not because they're great books and you can't put them down, but because you're just like, oh my God, get to the point. And by the time you get to the end, you're bored and the end is never really like, it's never good enough to justify having put yourself through that. I just feel like the beginning of this book, which is a, it's what I picture as if it were done on a, in a movie, this would be a montage of Jai Dai Show going to all of these different resources to try and find somebody to help him take Ethan Aurelius down. And every single place he goes, either Ethan's been there already and fucked his shit right up, which is hilarious, or the beings that he's speaking to are like, <clears throat> buddy, look, no, I understand. Trust me. But no, we are not doing that. Not here, kid. Find someone else to talk to. And then we have this like kind of deus ex machina dread god that it seems is going to be taking care of shit. And I can't, I really hope that we get to see how that goes. I'm dying to know. I am so happy that this author doesn't feel the need to put me through the ringer in terms of like, I thought, so here's what I thought. A, I thought Jai Daisho is going to find his weapon and I'm going to have to sit here with deep dread in my heart, waiting for him to unleash whatever it is that he found or make the deal or whatever. And I'm going to have to like, know this is coming and hate, Jai Dai show, but still be in his head, watching him like maybe in the short term win. Still feeling like eventually he will lose, but I have to sit through him winning first, which I hate. It's that sort of story like that you see all the time, right? Where the bad guy almost wins and then we have our comeback. It's very predictable. There's a reason that it is done so often because it works. But it does get tiring if you think you know that's what's coming. And we don't get that. B, the other thing I thought we were going to get. Lyndon in prison, being beaten up, being forced to defend himself, housed in gen pop with no food and no water and a fucking posse of fucking true golds down his throat. I really did. I thought we were going to get Oz or something like, and and I was going to have to sit through him just being victimized and all for the, the greater good for his ultimate strength. And no, no, we don't get that either. Now, that's not to say that's not coming, but I love that I thought that was how we were starting and that's not it at all. So I just expected two things that were really going to be pretty painful and the author spared me and did something not only unexpected, but so much more interesting. Just it, it, it's it, the, the, a lot of the dread and the pain of those other two options comes from them being predictable. The, it comes from me being like, oh, uh, I have to quote, sit through this until we get to the thing. It's me thinking I know how this is going to go and I just have to let it happen in order to get to the good part that I'm excited about. And, and no. So like I said, I may be in for that a little bit later down the road. But the fact that it's not being put in the place in the story that I expected it to be just... Thank you, Will White. Thank you for your mercy. We appreciate you. It's just, it's a breath of fresh air. So let's start off with this fucking Jai Daishu montage, because this is hilarious. This motherfucker is going up against, first he's going to this like family of crow remnants. Raven. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> These ravens fucking peck my eyes out for that disrespect. Um, I love the description of this. 
Mist swirled before the cliff as something moved beneath the cloud's surface. An instant later, wings of shadow rose from the gray cloud. Each of these wings was the size of a ship's sail, and the head that followed was bigger than a horse. It looked like a bird formed from living ink. The vast raven filled his vision, floating in the air with still wings. It remained motionless, not disturbing the icy wind with a single flap, drifting like a ghost instead of a living thing. Curls of darkness rose from its feathers. Jai Daishu inclined his head. As a supplicant, he should have bowed, but his back had locked up so tight he thought he might fold over backward. His lack of respect might kill him, and that thought chilled him as much as the remnant's presence. No matter how much he had prepared to throw his own life away if necessary, nothing could prepare him to come face to face with a spirit of death. This sounds badass as hell. I want to see it. I just keep saying that. I know. I'm sorry. I'm a broken record, but I really do. I want to see it. Um, so he offers a gift of a head from, I believe, the Aurelius clan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they flipped open the box, a stained helmet. Yeah, servant of the Aurelius family, whose name Jai Daishu had never learned. He needed a head, so he had taken one. Better to steal from his enemies than from his friends. Ugh. I just love the casual nature of this, the, the way it's just mentioned. Oh, yeah, he doesn't know who this is. He just needed a head, and he just picked somebody who wasn't from his side. And that's all he really needed to know. It's just... That, that casual cruelty, that it doesn't even occur to him, you know? Um, and it says, A dark and nebulous mist lifted from the corpse's head like smoke from a fire. Death Aura had once been difficult for him to see until he had learned the trick of it, until he had been accust become accustomed to its presence. So that's kind of neat, that there's this aura that until he started to edge towards death himself... And grow accustomed to that aura being around him. He never really got the hang of it. Um, so, the Lord of Spectres says, tell us the name of your enemy. And this is when Jai Daisho says, the feud between us cannot be solved except by blood. I can't kill him and I fear that when I die, his family will tear mine apart. His name is Ethan Aurelius. All of these other ravens, re raven remnants, are around while he's saying this. Fucking raisin hell. They are making a racket. And as soon as he says the name Athan Aurelius, all of them quiet right down. Athan Aurelius will not be taken. Choose another or be gone. And Jai Daishu, I love this. He had come prepared for a failure of negotiations, for hostility, for the Lord of Spectres to demand a price too high, but not for an immediate, flat-out refusal. And he tries to argue here, and the Raven's just like, he's our bud. I don't know what to tell you, but we are like this. I'm not fucking killing him, so... Pick somebody else. I'm tired of talking to you already. Figure it out. Um, Jai Daisha says he's only become your bud to protect himself. He want, he doesn't have any loyalty to you. He just wants to make you obligated to him. And the Raven's like, okay, maybe that's true. But it worked. <laughs> Too late. Sorry, buddy. Um, to act against him would bind our soul with chains of debt. You may name another, but not a feather of ours will harm Ethan Aurelius. So then, we go to these other dudes. The person he's talking to is named Moshi. Let me tell you something about that family. You don't ever take a contract against an Aurelius. Not a real Aurelius, anyway. They always see you coming. And then there's this Aurelius in particular. He doesn't just see you when you strike. He saw you when you got up this morning. 
And Chai Daisho tries to be like, what is that supposed to mean? You're acting like he's better than me or something. And Moshi doesn't answer, just laughs. And I live for that pettiness. They don't even say, it sounds like that because that's what I'm saying to you. They don't even have to. They're just like, <clears throat> you want another drink or like, I just fucking, it's so good. <laughs> Me and my boys would take out a contract on the heavens themselves. If the price was right, worst that could happen is we die. Right. But going up against somebody who knows you're coming and can do something about it. There's a difference between gambling and throwing your money down a well. And Jai Dai show pulls out this treasure, a scale made by the emperor, basically the most powerful person in the empire. And this is something that Jai Dai show had been collecting. He has, I think seven of them. Yeah. Seven. He had been collecting just to have them because it's a real honor to have done the kind of work that warrants this sort of reward. It's a, it, it's a trophy. He never thought that he was going to have to use them as bartering tools, that they would basically be traded for anything. But he's prepared to do it for this. And Moshi, it's not like it doesn't tempt him. He definitely stops and is sort of like, this is nice. I mean, it is. But he finally closes the box and gives it back. You have to prove to me that he's not watching us right now. You want somebody for a suicidal mission? Sure. We're your guys. But this is just suicide. So that's interesting. A suicidal mission is one thing. Suicide is its own thing. And these guys, it seems, are just sort of, uh, I don't even want to say they're undead. It sounds like they are kind of, though. I don't really know, you know, the, uh, I'm trying to find the spot where quite a few eyes turned to him. The barkeep, a one-legged boy in the corner, grinned at him, mocking they knew of his pride, but they showed open contempt for him anyway. You did not join the path of the last breath if you cared about staying alive. I am absolutely dying to know what this means. I really want to know about this path, but maybe we'll hear about it one day. Maybe not. Maybe it'll just be this mysterious, weird thing, which I'm also fine with. So then we go to the jungle. And Jai Daishu is walking through, and I should mention, all of these, like, encounters are punctuated with Jai Daisho reflecting on how much he hurts. He is not well, and everything that he's doing is costing him in energy and in effort. And it's really kind of like an, a testament to his pettiness that despite everything that he's, like, suffering right now, He's still willing to make these trips because that's how much he wants Aurelius taken down. It's so. What's so frustrating is that Jai Daisho was so certain that after he died, his family would just kind of collapse because there was nobody else fit to rule them. We don't get any mention of that from him here. We don't hear those thoughts in his head. We hear him tell the raven, I think that my family might be destroyed by him after I'm gone. And the thing that I think is really significant about that is there is no evidence that Athan would ever go after the Jai clan if Jai Daisho was taken out of the picture. We don't... There is nothing to indicate an ongoing feud between the Jai clan and the Aurelius clan, once this old motherfucker's out of the picture, he seems to be wanting there to be that kind of feud so that he can justify what he's doing for his own personal pettiness as being on behalf of his people, his family, for their benefit, their protection. 
I don't think it is, though, man. And I don't really think you're fooling anybody into thinking it is either. I think you are salty that he killed you once. And now you're trying to turn it into this like crusade. And you're pretending that they're going to come after your family. They're not. There's this one fight between Jai Long and Lyndon, and that's it. Otherwise, you kind of acknowledge that the Jai clan doesn't have a patriarch in, like, in the wings ready to take over. So whether or not you take out Athan, that's not really going to help them. You need to make your own bed and fix that situation up and get their, get an underlord set to take over your spot. But you're not doing that, are you? You're out here worrying about this other guy. That's none of your business. But he can't help himself because he's fucking salty. Uh, He's just... It's the... Exactly. That was what I was about to say. Tan B in the chat says, it sounds like he's projecting what he would do in their situation. That's exactly it. So you guys, if you've taken... um, If you try to apply for like big box store jobs... Um, or other jobs now, I think, do this too. You often have to take like a quiz with a series of multiple choice answers. And they use the answers that you give as an indicator on whether to hire you. And a lot of the questions have to do with, do you think people would steal, more people would steal if they believed they could get away with it? That sort of thing. And it's like all framed in this way that it makes it look like you're assessing other people when you answer these questions. But the psychology of the questions is actually pretty interesting because the questions are framed in such a way that when you you give your answer, it tells them something about you. And what I mean is the tests were created by psychologists. And what psychologists have learned is that people who are more suspicious of others tend to be themselves less trustworthy. And so they assign the motives that they have to strangers because it makes them feel better to believe that more people think like them than actually do because they don't want to believe that they're not a good, trustworthy person. So if you answer, yeah, I think more people would steal if they could get away with it. That's you letting them know I would steal if I could get away with it. And that's a bad answer. And they're not going to look at you. If you answer several questions in that way, that's a red flag for them. You're somebody they don't want the liability. That's Jai Daishu. He's out here being like, I bet this motherfucker's going to come after my family. Because he would do that. But guess what? Ethan's got bigger fish to fry, kid. He's not worried about this bullshit out here. He's over here trying to ascend to be an Abaddon is what I think he wants to do. And... You just don't even think that big. So you have no fucking concept of not worrying yourself about that kind of crap. It's it's like this is the kind of thing. Exactly the same shit, even though it sounds so silly. But you guys know what I mean. If you have Facebook friends who post stuff about like, I hate fake people. If you're fake, I can tell because such and such and I don't have fake friends and you know I'm real. I'm a real one because if you have to even say that shit, you are not a real one. You are a fake one. People who actually mind their business don't have to worry about that kind of shit. Grown-ups who know how to, to handle keeping decent people in their lives and keeping toxic ones out – don't have to post that kind of shit. Don't have to worry about fake people because they're not out here playing games. They're just trying to live their lives and have good people around them. It's just that sort of thing. You're telling on yourself. You're telling on yourself to everyone else. And you really think that you're like making a stand and making a point. All the point that you're making is that you are a messy bitch. That's it. And everybody can see it but you. Get it together, okay? Stop worrying about what's happening with them and look at your own shit. Now, I will admit, I don't know what else Jai Daishu has been up to. So I'm out here saying, oh, he hasn't set up an underlord to take his spot. For all I know, he has. Time has passed. 
For all I know, Jai Long has ascended to Underlord by now. I don't think so, but maybe he has. So maybe Jai Daishu feels comfortable going after Ethan Aurelius because he does feel that his house is in order. I hazard not, because I don't think he's somebody with his priorities straight. But if it turns out I'm wrong about that, I will admit it, and I will take back a portion of the messiness that I had assigned him in my head. But Jai Daishu is a messy bitch. That's my assessment. So, he goes into this fucking jungle that has killer trees in it that are out here eating fucking whole rabbits. It's awful. And there's a prison with what's called the Deep Walker Ape. Now, I got to tell you all, I don't know where this thing is, but I keep thinking about the monster in the vision that Surreal showed Lyndon. And I keep being like, is this the thing? Is that the thing? Is this the thing? I'm so paranoid about it. It's 30 years in the future. I bet we don't see it now. But I don't know. I'm worried. So I was like, oh, my God, Deep Walker Ape, is that the thing? It does say it had killed thousands before it was finally subdued by the previous empress and officially it had been executed. I, that was part of why I started to wonder, is this the thing? I wondered, is Jai Daishu going to be the one to release this thing? And is it going to happen early because of this like whole feud that wasn't actually part of the prediction that Surya looked at? Like, is it possible for this whole thing to be really sped up? And I don't know, you know, it's certainly still, it's a potential possibility. But he goes and and like, they, they should have destroyed the thing. But they decide to imprison it because you don't, throw away something that's at the level of Underlord. It could be used for the good of the Empire ostensibly, eventually. He goes to this thing and opens it up and there is just a note at the bottom that says nice try. I just hope to one day stick it to somebody I don't like at this level. If I can ever accomplish it, like at this level, I think I can die happy. That is the kind of level that you go to sleep at night with a smile on your face for the rest of your life. If you think about that, that is just some satisfying shit. And I love that Jai Dai show he had heard about people coughing up blood and anger and he literally begins to do it here. And he's like, huh, I wonder if that's because that's a real thing or if that's just because I'm already dying and this is my body just fucking up. And I'm honestly kind of uh, interested in the answer to that. But either way, he coughed up blood. Mission accomplished. So great. I love it so much. So finally, we have the last place that he goes, which is, as it turns out, this like kind of what's the word I want? It's like a <sighs> shit. I can't remember the word I want. Bank isn't the word. Treasure trove is too simple a word. I'm, I'm thinking of it as like a place that you keep weaponry, you know, vault. That works, Sandy. Armory. That's more it. That's, that's, I think, the word I wanted. It's just, it's a place filled with these incredibly advanced, powerful tools that when he goes in, he has to fight against his own greed to take more stuff than he intended. And I love this because I think that it's it's just so revealing about who he is that he goes in there and he isn't even really it's it, like he doesn't have a 
particular item in mind if I don't if I'm not mistaken or maybe he does but the first several things that he opens don't have anything in them and I kind of expected another note I kind of thought that we were going to get yet another like <laughs> uh nice try kind of moment you know and Instead, he sort of just goes through a bunch of the cabinets and stuff until he finally finds something. And it's a ring that is, I believe it's like white and has a blue stone in it. Um, I'm trying to find the spot where it's described here because it's not directly next. We cut to Linden for a little while and then we cut back. Um... Mm -mm -mm. But I thought it was significant, if I'm not mistaken, that the colors of this ring that he finds are Aurelius colors. He doesn't seem to see any significance in that, which I found a little bit surprising. Um, he, let's see. He was surprised at his own greed, but uh, his hands trembling as he reached to open the first cabinet. The, the bottom row of cubbies was the largest in each of these cabinets. Down this endless hallway, there were treasures of the ancients. Um, he pulled it open. It was empty. And he was sweating by this point. Where had all his wealth gone? He shook himself. He wasn't worried about riches, but about the fate of his family. He had to tell himself that very firmly. Ten more empty cabinets went by. So he does 28 and they're all empty, which begs the question... If people aren't supposed to be taking shit, where'd they go? And then here we go. Black gemstone. It wasn't blue. Okay, I take it back. A ring of pure white, scripted inside and out, set with a single black gemstone. Um, he swept his spirit through it. He couldn't sense anything. So he thinks that this is, because he can't sense anything, it has to be something that's beyond his ability to use, that it's something for an overlord or even one of the arch lords, which I'm dying to know about them. He sets it back in there. He moved to the next cabinet feeling like an idiot. Why couldn't he take the ring? Surely he could stuff his pockets. He knew why, because everything he took was another chance to get caught, and he could only carry one object at a time in his soul space. Ten more minutes passed before he found something that initial, uh, initially excited him. A duplicate of the Ancestor Spear. This shit is broken. This shit is broken. I feel that's significant too. It's a spear. It's a symbol of your family. That's your, your fucking path, man. And it's broken. Take a hint. But no, he can't. So then he finds this crystal ball and he touches it with his spirit. And it says he felt an endless will to devour that almost consumed him. He wanted to tear through every cabinet, cramming his pockets full. So what if he died in here? He would die the richest man in the world. And he recognizes what this is because of this reaction that he has. So he takes it into himself and he leaves just having taken that feeling a deep sense of regret that that's all he's taking, but knowing that he's doing the right thing. And then we get information requested Machiel's influence on Cradle. So I'm going to duck back a bit and we're going to talk about what happened with Suriel. Suriel gets called at the end of the last book to speak to Machiel, right? So she goes to see him and Machiel is sort of, he's reminding me of what people say about the Aurelius family because he can see so many things at once. He is able to accomplish so much by himself that would normally take like a team of people. Um, by her brief count, he was tracking over a thousand threads of fate at once, over hundreds of different worlds. Any other judge would have delegated this work in order to focus their power and attention only where it was needed, not Machiel. 
The only busier judge should be Telerial, the spider, who coordinated communications for all the Abaddon and simultaneously scouted for invasions. But he used his subordinates to cover practically every one of his duties. No wonder Machiel's hounds worshipped him so. He was worth a division all on his own. I was just talking yesterday with my friend Jamie, who, she's a manager at Starbucks, and she's a store manager, and we were talking about the difference in management that gets involved and knows how to do the job versus management that knows in theory how the job is supposed to be done. And Machiel is the kind of manager you want. This is somebody who does the shit, gets down in there and gets hands on and knows the way things work and isn't trying to constantly, like there's nothing wrong with delegating in general. You have to be able to do that if you're a good manager. But there's a difference between delegation because you are trusting good, competent people to do a thing that needs doing while you manage something else and delegation because you don't feel like it and you know they'll get it done and it'll be good enough. And I love this, like, Machiel's a bit of a pain in the ass, you can tell, but I respect the hustle, honestly. This is somebody who takes their job seriously, you know? Um, and he had dark brown skin, slightly wrinkled like a man in his 50s, and silver at the wings of his black short hair. He was trim and solidly built with a square jaw. As a girl, she would have said he looked like a soldier. Only his eyes stood out, blazing a brighter violet than the celestial lenses around him as he watched fate. So, he asks her to verify that Osriel is dead, and she's like, no, I don't think he's dead, and I really don't believe it. And he asks, why do you think he would do that? Even though she knows he has his theory, he just wants to know her opinion. So she says, I think he just wanted to get a replacement. Um, and it says, let's see, Machio's hands paused for half a second and she felt a ripple in fate as possibilities began tumbling like a handful of dice. For her to feel such a working, even in the midst of his normal activity, meant he had exerted himself to check something or to change something. She would have to investigate later. Um, so at this point, he says, what were you doing in Harrow? Uh, and G Gadriel was ordered to show you the cost of Osriel's absence. You chose to stay and cleanse the world yourself. And she's thinking to herself, yeah, you knew I was going to do that, though. And doesn't say anything. And he sort of accuses her like, you know that you're supposed to be looking for Osriel, but in staying behind to deal with these people, that cost you like months of time in which you could have been looking for him. Um, that you stumbled on evidence of him was due to his foresight, not your success as a hunter. And where were you before that? And... It says immediately she saw where he was headed with this line of questioning. He hadn't bothered to hide it. Her stomach twisted and her anger gained greater heat before you choked it off. You were in Cradle, he continued, where you knew you would not find Osriel because he could not hide there. You knew you had a plausible excuse for checking his home world. I want to restore the Abaddon. Abaddon, she said, you have been tearing the wound deeper for centuries. Um, he remained doggedly focused. You went to Cradle for a breath of fresh air to consider your options and to decide if you wanted to hunt Osriel at all. Convenient, then, that your search has ended before you ever started looking for him. And that's interesting to me. I... Don't like because her next sentence to him is if he didn't want me looking for him, there were easier ways to stop me. It seems like she's telling him I wasn't trying to avoid looking for him. He successfully manipulated me into it. Or maybe I'm misunderstanding this. Um, 
He says he knew you could find him. Your odds of finding him must have been much higher without this plan. Since I don't know about his fake death scene, I couldn't factor it into my projections. He blinded me and he kept you sidetracked. Um, so she's like irritated at this because she, when she says you've been like digging the wound deeper, I don't feel like we get a lot of information about what exactly that means, what it is that Machiel has done, what the wound is. Like, I believe that the wound is just that Osriel is the only one that can accomplish this, uh, handling of the different, what are they called again? The different, ah, uh, it's like the different universes, basically. But I know that they have another word. Um, Osrio iterations. Thank you, Andy. Um, Osrio can destroy them without them being like, basically turning into a bunch of infected spores that infect other worlds. And it sounds like Machiel has been kind of trying to fight Osriel's attempts to retire. And that's like the main bone of contention here is that I think she kind of like understood where Osriel was coming from there. And Machiel was not willing to allow him to like, he considered it a duty, you know, you're the one being with the ability to do this effectively. You have a responsibility and that's that. But I might be misunderstanding this. Um, so she's about to just leave because she's just irritated and she feels like he just brought her here to kind of pester her. And uh, he says, let's talk about the changes you made to Cradle. And she looks at Wei Shi Linden, who has got – we see from her perspective and we see later on from the Sky Sworn perspective – Lyndon's got a bit of a vibe to him lately that makes him seem more threatening. He seems, sh she describes him as sullen. The Sky Sworn describes him as looking for a fight, constantly like looking belligerent. Um, and it says, why had Machiel shown her this? She turned, allowing her portal to close. What changes did you make in this young man's life? He asked. So she tells him and he's like, okay, that's within the rules. Everything you did was fine. Somebody else didn't stay within the rules though. That, this wasn't you. And he says, Osriel left something behind, it seems, for his descendants. The picture changed to show a man in his early 30s, handsome and smiling with blonde hair trailing behind him. Obviously, this is Ethan. Uh, the man was training her, Ethan Aurelius. A touch of anger entered Machiel's voice. Osriel's bloodline from before he was Osriel. He worked against us before he ever gained his mantle. And Suriel's remembering an, article, um, an artifact that had been found by one of his descendants quote, altering that man's destiny. And I'm assuming that this is the marble that he has still, but maybe not. Maybe that marble is simply the, uh, the evidence that, you know, an Abaddon was involved with them. And the actual artifact was something totally other. Um, I am not certain you know, it sounds like it's the marble, but I don't know what kind of power those inherently have. Um, in their On their own, neither of those changes had been significant. Together, they would be exponentially more dangerous and more difficult to predict. Their actions would have affected all of Cradle, the Hound said. They would work for decades, changing the iteration and eventually derailing it entirely. I cannot see any further than 30 years in Cradle's future. 30 years. That's the amount of time she gave to Linden. Um, either that meant Cradle would be destroyed or would have changed so drastically that its relationship to fate shifted. Either way, they couldn't jeopardize Cradle. It produced an Abaddon candidate every century or so, 
far more than any other iteration. I want to know why that is. Is there a reason for that? There's none given here, but I feel like that's fucking significant, and I want to know about that. Um, and Surreal says that she'll resolve it, and he tells her, this is my job, and I promise I'm not going to just go kill the kid. I'm not going to do that. He says, I intend to accelerate events so that they cannot stay within the confines of the world for so long. The faster they are gone, the lesser the damage. If I am successful, their world itself will eventually force them to leave and will not tolerate their staying and making alterations. However, this does increase the personal risks to both subjects. This was a peace offering from Machiel to her, fixing the problem she had helped create while keeping her favored mortal intact all the while demonstrating the damage that Osriel's meddling could cause. She appreciated the gesture. gesture. Perhaps Machia was willing to work together for unity after all. Look, I'm not sure I believe this. It sounds to me like the, the Aurelius, like, family lines deal sounds a lot more like Machia's deal than Osriel's deal. I don't, like, what, how do we know what he's saying is true here? I don't trust him. I, I don't trust him. I'm just saying. And also when he says he was working against us before he ever picked up his mantle, that's, that's like, you're assigning him actual motive there. It's not just accidental. You know, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Um... Yeah, I'm just very curious about this. This is all, it's a little bit confusing. I'm not even sure that I completely understand it. But basically what Machiel ends up doing is Jai Daisho goes in, into that armory, takes his prize, leaves, and he is pretty certain that he's going to get out of here without anybody ever even knowing he was here. Because evidently, it's just a sort of uh he has taken an oath as an underlord to not go in here and take shit and there doesn't seem to be an amazing security system in place it's just set up that it, it's extremely dangerous there's too much like good shit in there and that could all cause a ton of trouble if it's out in the world and yet he mentions how at other times, the door to it has been like left open for a long time before something bad happened. So Jai Daisha is pretty certain if he goes in, picks the one thing, and then leaves right away and closes it up behind him, no harm, no foul, nobody's going to know. What Machiel does is makes there be harm and foul so that somebody knows. And that somebody that he alerts to the to Jai Daisho being here is a dread god, which is something that I had asked about, like just at the last episode, because we find out that the uh, Madra belt that that Yaren is wearing is a fragment of one. So that's like you know one of the first times that we hear about one. And then we have that the dread gods are the ones that sort of get drawn to this vault of stuff because of the power of the underlords. Um, it's, he thinks that they're not going to be watching closely because he went and consulted with some oracles who didn't see any evidence of a dread god being active or around or noticing that he was here. So he goes and gets his thing. And then we have uh, Machiel's influence. The Jai Patriarch exits the labyrinth proud of his prize. The facility's unique aura shone like a beacon for the duration of his visit, 26 minutes. In 99 out of 100 projections, this aura goes unnoticed. Jai Daisho returns from his trip safely. There is only a negligible chance that a dread god will notice this aura, which calls to them like the scent of meat to a predator, and choose to investigate. His gamble paid off. 
But Machio is like, basically what he does is he goes over to a dread god and hangs a little piece of steak in front of its nose. It's asleep, but it starts sniffing. And it wakes up and it's like, steak? And he chucks it at Jai Daisho. And this shit goes after him. The bleeding phoenix regains a fraction of its consciousness. It catches the scent of power it has almost forgotten, power long lost. It calls to a memory buried deep in the creature's awareness. For the first time in centuries, its bloody feathers stir. The members of Red Moon Hall, from Jade to Herald, fall to their knees in supplication. Jade to Herald. Herald! What's Herald? Their master has spoken to them through its blood shadows, preparing them. They must head north and pave the way. Jai Daisho, I don't think you're ready. You better prepare yourself. And I hope that whatever it is that you just sucked into you is going to, you know, be of some assistance. I don't really hope that. I hope you die. But what can you do? Suggested topic, Yaren, reluctant host of a sealed blood shadow. Continue? So, we go to Yaren, who's cycling, and she feels this urge to destroy come over her, but she knows it's coming from this fucking Madra around her waist. It's not Madra. That's what people think it might be. Nobody can really tell. We know it's not, but I keep calling it that because it's just easier. Um, an idle hand moves behind her to feel the knot tied in her blood shadow, her fingertips pass through it as though through a liquid, though nothing remains on her skin. Thoughts pushed aside, a momentary distraction. She returns to her training. Report complete. Report not complete, please. I would like more of that information. You did not give me any information. That is not helpful. I resent it. Okay, now we're going to go over to the, the main event here, which is Linden. And I know I only have like 10 minutes left to talk about Linden, but not a whole lot has actually happened with Lyndon yet. First of all, we find out that Lyndon is staying in a pretty swank situation. I'm expecting him to have been thrown in a hole somewhere with a bunch of other... No, no, no. I misunderstood his arrest. It turns out, really, he's not even really arrested. He's been taken into custody because of the optics of a black flame being out in the world this is bad news people will freak out and so for the sake of everybody and the safety of everybody they pull him out of a situation where he will be near other people they do not trust him they do not trust the public so it's not exactly that he's arrested he's being isolated but it turns out not super effectively. So we go to Renfei. Renfei and Bairu, who we saw at the end of the last book, actually taking Lyndon away, are walking through a series of security measures. And it's really funny. There is so much to this. There's just, first, there's like a bunch of uh, like illusion magic. There's a like pit that looks like it's bottomless, but really there's like something at the bottom that will definitely eat you. Um, I love Bairu as they're walking through being like, this really feels a little bit excessive. And she's like, mm, I'm not sure it is. We're going to see in a second, but we'll see. Um, the next door was wooden and open to a physical simple key and lock. A pair of crimson lions waited at the end of the room, embers burning in their eyes, flames building in their throats, remnants sealed to the de defense of the room. Um, the remnants had been trugal, but were fed weakly to make them even more formidable. And they part and let them through. Tons of stuff like this. Eventually, finally, they get through all of the security stuff. And... I love this. It's just the series of things they go through. And they get to the end, to Lyndon's room. 
which is surrounded by bars so that you can see everything in there at once. And he's not even behind the fucking bars. He's not even in there, you guys. It is so funny. We saw him a little earlier than this trying to make nice with whomever it is that's bringing his meals. He had first tried to burn through the wall. Didn't work. So trying to like ingratiate himself with whoever's bringing him his meals is his next attempt. That does not work. He doesn't know how much time has passed. He's starting to get very agitated. And then somebody comes to the door and it's Ethan and Yaren. And he's like, what are you here to break me out? To which Ethan's like, break you out. No, <laughs> sit down. We're going to go to work, get to work. So when they get here, Lyndon is in the midst of a fucking training session. And we find out that they had moved him, uh, I think, like six different places. It might have been more than that. They've moved him a bunch of times in an attempt to keep Aethan Aurelius out, and they just never managed to do it. It just, and they kind of know as they reach the end of this series of, of security measures that they're going to find him there again, but they just can't imagine how this dude got through them all with apparently no effort. There's nothing to, there's no evidence on these security systems that somebody got through at all. You know, nothing's broken. The remnants are still here. Everything looks like it's still in place. And yet there's a literal crowd on the other side that isn't supposed to be here. And she just she asks Ethan how he did it. And he just doesn't say shit to her about it. Um, so I love this. Lyndon is fighting and he's got like blood trailing down his lip and he's scuffed up and just you know, not looking great. He looked like the kind of young man who started fights for fun. Over her interactions with him in the last several months, she had grown to realize that he was practically the opposite. A troublemaker, certainly, but of a very different type. And we've got Yaren here, who's fighting against him. We've got Ethan, who's off to the side painting a picture of the top secret place that we're going to be having the fucking contest in a little bit. We have Fisher Gesha, who's over here with her fucking, like, soul smithing, offering him all kinds of weapons. It is crowded. Um, oh, 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 and... Orthos is here. I can't believe I almost forgot Orthos. Orthos, the giant fiery turtle is here. I just, it's so funny. Honestly, it is. Like, and I love that Renfe is so irritated. And she's just trying to do her job. She's resentful of Ethan because he just doesn't seem to give a shit about the fact that every time he does this, he gets her in trouble. And... I really relate to that. I really understand what that is like. It's, you know, oh, you're so whimsical doing what you want and you don't give a shit that I'm getting written up again, you know? Um, so we, <laughs> we have them all uh, apparently preparing for Lyndon's final contest against Jai Long. The shock I felt at realizing that the time has gone by that we aren't spending the rest of this whole book preparing and that the contest with Jai Long is about to happen. I don't even know what I, I, I just, that is so quick. As far as how I think that is actually going to go, I really don't know because he saved Jai Long's sister and part of me is like, is John Long even going to be willing to fight him? I really, if Gokran were still alive, I would think for sure, yes. Because Gokran is dead, right? He lost a hand first, but I think he died. Yeah, they all died. Him and all of his sand vipers died at once. So if Gokran were still alive, I'd feel that Jai Long would really feel this like obligation to his sort of like foster father but Gokran's not alive I don't know what Jai Long's relationship with the Sand Vipers is anymore if they don't have a relationship 
he may be willing to just not do it. But if he were, why would they be setting this whole thing up this way? He would have let them know he was going to drop it. If it's just a matter of his honor, I don't really know how that would go. Like, I am surprised that this is being allowed to go forward at all. Because as far as I knew, Jai Daisho had basically told Jai Long, we're not you're not fighting the kid. This is not good optics for us in either case. I think he said, if you beat him, there's no honor in that. And if you lose, it's humiliating. So you're not doing either one. So the fact that this is still carrying forward is surprising. I just don't know what to think. So Lyndon takes a bunch of weapons uh, basically loads himself down to the point that everybody's kind of like side eyeing him like, man, I know that you want to like make sure that you're prepared, but you may be just kind of hampering yourself here if you take too much of this stuff. And they bring him to the top of this mountain where the the contest is going to take place. And it is like really brutal. He realizes that even if he were only like Jade level, He'd have been blown right the hell off. He would have used all of his Madra to stay on and he probably wouldn't even have managed to do it. Um, so this is the, this is the day. Um, Ethan had brought Yaren and the others to him more than 10 times. And each time the Sky Sworn either moved him or increased security. It never seemed to matter. Okay. I thought it was more than six times. Um, the others, especially Yaren and Fisher Gesha, had done everything they could to prepare him for this day. He was as ready as he could be. And I love that he thinks about Ethan's like prediction that he has about a 30% chance of success, which he considers pretty good. Yikes. Um, and I love that he keeps looking at Renfei and how like competent she is and in control she is. And he's very envious of that. He wishes that he were able to sort of project that sense of control and calm. Um, and she comes at him and tells him that they need his weapons. And he gets very agitated because they took his pack away and never gave it back. So he's like, well, are you going to give me my shit back? And she's like, we'll give you back what you are allowed to have for your stage of advancement. But you're not allowed to just carry in an Underlord level weapon when you're, uh, you know, a couple of golds going up against each other. That's not going to happen. He asks whether or not uh, Orthos can come in with him. And she kind of smirks and is like, Orthos is only allowed to bring you in as his backup for his fight. You are of a lower level. And so he is not your backup. That is not going to happen. Sorry, kid, but no. Um, and the low gold stuff, like he has a, a several things that are under gold level. Um, and the artificial heart on his chest, the band around his forehead, two more of his constructs were true gold, four were high gold. They sealed all those into a scripted box that by produced by Rue, I think but kept the low gold devices in a sack. They would be returned to him quickly, he assumed. He hoped. Um, and she says, your first core is Jade. Renfei flicked her spirit through Linden's and he froze, wondering if she would see past the first of his surprises. But she said, Jade, and he relaxed. I think that he means about being pure Madra on that side, if I'm not mistaken. Your second core is low gold, so you go on record as a low gold. You can take in weapons appropriate to your stage. As expected, they missed Surreal's marble. The glass ball sat tucked into his pocket, burning with a steady blue candle flame. Had they looked inside, they would have seen it, but they had done all their searching with their spiritual senses. They also left him his badge, which was heavy and cold against his chest. It was made of gold, etched with a hammer, and it reminded him of home. Nothing reminded him that he was a sacred artist of Sacred Valley like that badge. So I like that he's allowed to keep that. Um, so he goes in and it turns out that 
he is outside. Again, this room was a hundred yards square and had no furnishings at all. Besides the wall behind Linden with its single door, everything else was open to the sky. The underlords were already waiting. And that's the end of this section. And I am just dying. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. So, yeah, next time, guys, I'll be back on Tuesday. Um, thank you again, Andy, for commissioning this. Super excited. And I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.